I guess uh, we can get started, stop of the hour, and uh, we are here assembling for a very, very interesting chat. So I first want to say good afternoon or good morning, wherever you're joining us from. On behalf of ASCOA and America's Quarterly, I want to welcome uh, you all to this discussion on a subject that has been floating for a while, but that has uh, really found a lot of audience and interest uh, lately. It was thrust front and center when the pandemic hit. Of course, we all know we are here to discuss universal basic income, panacea or waste of resources. My name is Cecilia Tornaghi and I'm managing editor for America's Quarterly. I am joined today by a distinguished group. We have a, a fellow Brazilian, uh, Laura Carvalho joins us from Sao Paulo. She's associate professor of economics at Universidade de São Paulo, USP. Marcela Eslava joins us from Colombia, where she's an economics professor and dean of the School of Economics at Universidad de los Andes. And last but not least, of course, Eduardo Levi Yati, who is uh, dean of the School of Government at Universidad Torquato de Tela in Argentina. So we have a Southern uh, Southern uh, America's uh, panel here today, but looking at this at this important issue. Before we start, I want to remind everyone to please keep your mics on mute uh, if you're not speaking. We believe this will be a lively discussion, so we welcome your participation. And for those watching on WebEx, uh, you can ask your questions via the chat uh, line on the side. You can send a private message to. Q&A moderator, and then we will get your, your make sure they will ask you a question. And if you're watching over the live stream, this event is being live streamed and open to the public uh, through our website, through ASUA website, as well as on Twitter. You can send your questions over Twitter. You just use uh, the, uh, the at ASUA line and we'll get your questions, or you can comment directly on the live stream feed. Without delay, we want to make this as lively a conversation as possible, and there's a lot of ground uh, to cover. So we want to go, Universal Basic Income had already started to join the conversation due to automation, technology changes, and disruptions, potential disruptions to job markets across the board. Even in the US, it made an appearance in the uh, uh, during the Democratic primary debates. So the issue has really taken uh, a front and center position. But after the COVID-19 crisis, it really took a different uh, a different Im impulse here. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, income guarantee became almost like an urgent need. We saw countries across the board trying to develop different ways of, of, of uh, deploying cash quickly as people weren't out, you know, losing their livelihoods due to lockdowns and stay at home orders. So many schemes were deployed, none quite to be called universal. But the fact is that the question of whether UBI is a solution and uh, an option for Latin America did come up uh, to, the, to, to the front and center right now. And whether Latin America can do it and whether it is a solution for Latin America. That's what we want to kind of dive in a little bit more today. And I don't want to take a moment, I want to start straight with, uh, with Laura, because in Brazil, there was the uh, emergency cash transfer that uh, was uh, was uh, deployed for a three month period, but a lot of discussion has been surfacing about uh, to make it permanent as a need to make it permanent or uh, for a while. But the question is, should we even be discussing making something like this permanent at this point in time when everybody's diving into debt anyway, and while the region is trying to to pay for the health needs and everything for COVID nineteen and even becoming universal, is it the time to even discuss it as a universal possibility? Laura. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, thank you for the invitation and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here um, discussing with other fellow Latin Americans uh, this important issue. I do think that uh, it is a, a, a topic that is urgent, not only now, but it was becoming urgent. Um, in Brazil for the past years and even decades, let's say. Brazil has a, an experience with 
social policies that have been very effective in the past. So, of course, Programa Bolsa Família has become uh, very well known worldwide. It had uh, it's it's still, I think, in terms of how many recipients of the program we have, uh, the largest conditional cash transfer program in the world. Uh, it had big impacts in reducing inequality at the bottom of the distribution during the 2000s in particular, when it was expanded uh, the most. Um, and of course, that has created, um, uh, that has helped us um, uh, reduce poverty and extreme poverty um, in significant levels um, in in the 2000s when the economy was growing. But then in the past years, Brazil has suffered uh, a very deep economic crisis uh, that was followed by pretty much stagnation. And stagnation came together with a big increase in the informal sector in the labor market. We had uh, before COVID-19, already 40% of the population uh, of the working force in informal jobs. Uh, we, more than 40 actually, uh, we, we increased our in unemployment rate, uh, even with the increase in informality, of course, absorbing part of the, of the uh, workforce that wasn't able to find a job. Uh, we increased the employment rate to 11%, so that was the level we had before COVID-19, which means that, uh, of course, the crisis in Brazil hits uh, much faster and much stronger uh, than in rich countries, right? Uh, these workers have no buffer, and Bolsa Familia already had lines of people trying to jump into the program and uh, who could not jump in because the government was cutting the budget for social policy. So uh, I do think that the, the emergency um, uh, cash relief that was approved, which of course did not come from the initiative of the, gov the federal government, uh, the federal government had a much more modest proposal of uh, three times less the amount that people would uh, receive and also a much smaller uh, universe of, of recipients. So the, the program that ended up being approved in Congress uh, came with a very important uh, uh, mobilization from civil society and, and, and other institutions uh, and ended up uh, costing 10 times more than the program that the government had uh, at the beginning suggested. And so the question is, I do think that the making it permanent is important, but of course, the program as it is now has a, a huge cost. Uh, we, we are talking about 2%, more than 2% of GDP that was, uh, that is now uh, for the three month period uh, that the program will last, uh, according to the, the Congress's, I mean, the, the first law project, it can be extended uh, until the end of the year, but it's unclear now whether it will happen. It will happen. Uh, the, the, the cost is 2% of GDP of this three month period program. So uh, obviously uh, we, we do need to think about uh, a permanent reform of our social protection system that, uh, lead, that I don't know, give more steps into uh, making, creating universal uh, minimum income or any, or something like that. But um, this has to be redesigned in a way that is also viable uh, in, in, the next, in the next few years. And it can also happen gradually. We don't need to make this particular um, program permanent uh, as the cost would be really huge, but we can, uh, take advantage of the database that we created to to give the money to the recipients now and and the technology that we're developing to to implement the the, the emergency cash relief as a way to to build uh, political support and also the economic capacity to um, ref make, create a, a more a deeper reform of our our social protection system including uh, um, getting rid of other programs that may uh, um, somehow 
uh, substit be substituted by by a universal basic income. That, that's a point that I want to uh, get go back to at some point because really, you know, if you pay for this, you don't pay for that, right? So this, <laughs> there is that question. But the, when you say two percent of GDP, Marcelo, I want you to to take from from Colombia perspective, but also um, somewhat regional. I mean, at that level of of cost for something like that is, especially Colombia has a, a fiscal target even. How much work needs to be done for it to be even um, viable or to, to even consider this? And 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 adding all that with that level of cost, do you think that this is, in your view, uh, the best use of uh, of resources? Well, I think it depends on what we call this. So, if what if by this what we call is the extension of the current emergency programs, which are not re really universal, but, but as Laurie was saying, targeted to specific uh, segments of the population that are particularly vulnerable to the crisis. Uh, then uh, there is indeed a, a huge fiscal cost of extending what has been planned as emergency uh, aid. Uh, I'm not sure that the best way to proceed in terms of discussing and adopting a potential UBI is uh, just the extension of the current emergency programs. One, because I think the magnitude of the crisis that we're facing uh, is set such and the urgency is such that uh, those programs need to be designed to uh, primarily mitigate the effects of the of the current crisis and that demands a lot of resources um, and so uh, some of these programs are in the ranges of two or three percent of the GDP thinking of uh, two or three months of uh, help to people so this if this is going to be extended uh, and, and potentially say for a year suppose uh, uh, some countries in Colombia, the talk at some points is about potentially extending some of the lockdowns, even to the point when the vaccine is uh, becomes available, which could happen in many months or not happen, not happen at all. So, so that that mounts to a, a huge uh, cost that I don't think uh, countries can simply engage uh, on uh, without uh, further structuring of the package. So if the question of is whether these programs can simply be extended as, as such, I think the answer is no. And I think they need to be planned in terms of emergency help. Now, I th that's different uh, than saying that a potential UBI, and by that I mean a, a, a system that's truly universal where everybody uh, gets a check from the government at some point. That's not to say that, uh, that that is simply impossible, but it is to say, of course, that if that sort of thing is to be discussed and assigned, uh, a, a very holistic view of the program of the of the program needs to be uh, taken, and that implies uh, some sort of uh, of revenue generation that's uh, dedicated to the program. Uh, UBI programs that are truly universal have some advantages, and I think uh, Latin America may gain some of those things. Uh, some may gain from those programs in some of those dimensions that I'm sure we'll be discussing uh, during the program. Uh, but uh, but but they of course imply a fiscal cost that that needs to be uh, uh, taken into account and designed. Yeah, it's like which direction to go. And there is this the fiscal cost, but there is the political cost because bringing it in that requires maybe tax reforms or requires one or just to, you know, be seen a distribution of wealth. So the issue of a political cost, Eduardo, I'm gonna bring you in to, to weigh on a, a little bit on that side of, of this as well. Because of course, you know, the most beautiful uh, economic model in the world doesn't doesn't work if it doesn't have political support and and you know and, and and push. So, do you see a political landscape in Latin America where this could be a priority? A UBI, and I'm going to say this <laughs> as a universal basic income, because I think that there is almost a consensus that the emergency cash transfers were a need at this point during the pandemic, but. Uh, we do have the chronic inequality, informality, and other issues that have been pushed. We're going to have 
a deep dive into poverty, according to the World Bank, another 60 million globally, but uh, these numbers certainly include Latin America. So Eduardo, do you think that politically, uh, a universal basic income is something that fits Latin America? I think we lost yeah. Eduardo. Oh, no, here, you, here he is. Oh, I think, yeah, sorry, I was muted. I think we need to go uh, step by step. The first thing you have to notice that, uh, I mean, we have been discussing until now the emerging three income. Emerging three income, I don't know in Brazil, but I guess that it's the same as in Argentina, it's not universal, it's targeted. It's targeted to essentially whoever cannot get any other thing from your jobs. I mean, if you don't have a salary job, if you have a salary job, you have super job supplements, subventions with partial payment in full of work. Uh, the problem is we have less than half of our labor force and it's under the salary job and the rest are essentially, you know, but on their own. And that's where they are sent to the uh, emergency income line. That have different names in Argentina. We have one that's called essentially household emergency income and we have about uh, close to 10 million. You know, I think it's 9 million people because the household, you know, there was a lot of problems, inclusion, inclusion. So basically everybody got the point is that income costs about 2% GDP, more or less. It's not on the same lines that I think Laura was mentioning. Um, it could be preserved if it's at the expense of other programs, but it's uh, terribly targeted because it's in the middle of a crisis. You don't want to be really putting in a crisis. And, um, and the universe, if that's the idea, if the idea is having something like a minimum guaranteed income, which is not in the air, then the universe could be uh, largely reduced by taking care of the other elephant in the room, which is independent work, informal work. If you have a regime for, say, independent work, self-employed, that can get some protection, you know, job protections like any other salaried worker, then the guarantee will only go to a much smaller population. And then the cost might be fiscally viable if you accommodate, you know, you know, if you consolidate uh, partially the social spending. Uh, going from there to UBI is completely different question. There are many answers, many questions we have to resolve, not only fiscal, there are questions related to moral questions, essentially, should everybody receive that? Should be based on a job, in which case you will have uh, incentives to work, a job supplement to complement, say, you know, fewer hours because of technological unemployment pushing uh, unions to reduce uh, labor with working hours so that everybody can have a job. That's one story. Or should we have something close to the liberal view, Mr. Mr. Uh, Milton Friedman's view of a negative income tax, in which only the poor guys actually receive that, or universal, which is a classic, right? Uh, that discussion politically has not even started in our country. I think we're closer to the minimum guarantee in this pandemic will move forward that agenda. That agenda. I, I don't think pushing everything, putting everything on the table would actually help, you know, um, advance this agenda. You have to be very precise. If you ask me, I think I would go politically for a debate on guaranteed minimum income, complement it with a strong effort to actually uh, integrate and generate a new regime for self-employed, independent workers, so they can have something different from just the guaranteed income. And, and we move from there on, and we'll see how it happens. But right now, politically, let alone fiscally, I don't think Latin America is prepared to just move full through to uh, UBI. Yeah, I, I, there is one side to making it universal, even on the cost side of any program per se, right? But we're talking, so if everybody gets it, there is no need to manage a program per se. So that cuts some kind of cost somewhere. But uh, the, the uh, you know, the, it's it's kind of interesting that it's in in both sides of the spectrum, right? It's in in the political spectrum. There are two two views of of this idea, but pushing for this idea. But there is one specific um, issue, Lisa. We, we we published a story today on Maricá, which is a, a small town in in Brazil, in the coastal town in Rio de Janeiro. They've been doing this uh, guaranteed income since 2013, but pushing towards getting to to a UBI situation within the constraints of, of the town. So there's a research going on, they started, and the main, one main question when I ask them is like inflation. I mean, the question here is like giving money to everybody, what happens to inflation? So Marcel, I wanna bring you in this one. So at the macro level, if we do have uh, UBI, couldn't we just be actually shooting ourselves on the foot, creating inflation, which then 
takes uh, uh, purchasing power away from people and also uh, politically uh, not not that happy. So how do you see inflation if we do if we did have the the uh, possibility of, of having something that is actually universal? I don't think that that should be a major concern unless uh, if, if we extrapolate your story to uh, to the macro economy and we're thinking of a country, uh, engaging in this kind of program. Uh, if, if obviously if this were to be financed via printing money, uh, then there probably should be a concern. But if we're thinking of something that is financed through taxation, where taxes are uh, collected on the income that people uh, already generated, then this UEI is a matter of redistributing resources rather than putting into the hands of people resources that do not exist, which is uh, what uh, is inflationary. So in that sense, I think again, uh, going back to the earlier points that were made, uh, I don't think we can think of these programs, uh, neither the, the, the income guarantee program nor a UBI program, just by themselves. It's something that you just uh, say, go and say, people are going to receive these. Uh, these programs need to be carefully designed in, in a package that uh, that is uh, contained, self-contained in the sense of also saying, where are the resources for these coming from? And, and I think the uh, th that's where you can uh, uh, deal with this potential risks. Uh, some of those risks, risks uh, arise only depending on how you finance this, as the example that I just gave. And we actually have a, a question uh, from from a, a viewer on live stream, um, um, Christopher Scher. So he's asking something on, a, on on that if the UBI wouldn't just replace all other social programs uh, and, and by definition, and therefore will be will cut fiscal costs and uh, expensive administration reduce. Laura, is there like a, a, a view on that, or what was the? Uh, uh, the logic of of actually cutting every other program is that is that something that would make sense? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't think UBI replaces, for instance, a contributory uh, pension system or or other parts of the social protection system that. Uh, are not uh, related to, um, say, creating uh, a minimum for for those mo most vulnerable. I think uh, UBI should be th thought as a complement of, uh, for instance, a public pension system and, and other programs. But it is true that in Brazil, in our particular case, we do have, for example, a non-contributory uh, uh, transfer, cash transfer for um, pe elderly people who receive below a certain uh, four times uh, less of the minimum wage, a quarter of the minimum wage. We have a Bolsa Familia that gives money to the really poor people. And those programs in particular could be put together um, in the in the UB, in a system uh, of, of the UBI. So you would get rid of a lot of administrative costs related to targeted uh, cash transfers that uh, need to check whether people do have their incomes uh, below the, the, a certain level or don't. Uh, and in that way, I mean, you do save a lot. And then the discussion of UBI since forever and, and the, the larger debate, the broader debate on targeting versus universalization of, of social programs, this is very clear. I mean, one of the advantages of, of UBI is that you get rid of a lot of administrative costs. And I tend to agree with with Marcela that of course you have to 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 put together a package in that sense. And and when I was talking about a reform of our social social protection system, um, that comes with a reform of the taxation system uh, as well. And 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 uh, even if we don't go. Uh, towards the say the the most the liberal Friedmanian uh, idea of a, of a negative tax in which basically you have um, the, the the very poor getting uh, a minimum a minimum a minimum income but then 
that basically is funded by um, different tax brackets uh, when you move to the top of the distribution, right? Um, still, if, if you have a UBI uh, as really such, meaning everyone gets income, at the very end, at the very bottom, in terms of distribution, it's not very different from what you what you had in the in Friedman's uh, negative taxation. In, in terms of the distribution, not in terms of the rights and the understanding of the principle, the basic principle of the program. But if you create, for instance, income taxation uh, that is uh, basically compensating for the UBI for those at the top. Uh, this basically means that some people will have positive taxation and some people will have an, uh, the, only the benefits, right? So uh, in a way, it is, it's, it's perfectly possible to think of a scheme like that, in, in particular in Latin American uh, economies, which tend to, to tax very, to have very low tax rates at the top of the distribution in terms of income taxation um, relative to, to rich countries. So I, I don't think the I think that it is viable, it is possible. But as I said at the beginning, uh, things like that have to move gradually, and and of course the political support for it, and in particular for the scheme that goes into the taxation side, is the is the difficult is the most difficult part. Uh, I do think that the emergency cash relief uh, that was given to a fraction of the population now. Uh, does help building that political support. Uh, so the way uh, the current situation helps is, is exactly in terms of creating a political cost for removing those reliefs, right? So, I mean, the, the moment in which people who are getting this 600 Brazilian reais or $100 in current uh, exchange rates um, uh, lose this program, and get uh, and some of them get back to the less than 200 reais uh, uh, that the Bolsa Familia was giving. Uh, some others just are left without anything, uh, the informal workers and so on. Uh, basically, um, you you create a, a political reaction that can that can actually that can somehow build into this debate. And I think this will happen. Uh, very soon in Brazil, especially as the, the economic crisis will be far from over when uh, this program ends and people will be very unhappy to lose their benefits. And that's how yeah. political support uh, can, can be built, uh, I would say. Yeah, so they, the, the emergency plans are sort of creating an environment for, for political support in there. So uh, I want to actually just remind everyone who can ask questions, you can uh, put questions on the WebEx. Uh, you can uh, send it on, on the WebEx to me or to, I think that I'm told that the Q&A moderator is acting out, but you can you can send it on my, I can see it here too, on Twitter, on live stream. So please ask your questions. We have a bunch here, but I want to add sort of mix uh, uh, a question from, from the audience here asking uh, about what are the arguments against UBI that we could, should get over and prove them wrong? This is a question, but my question would be, why uh, why this as opposed to actually investing in infrastructure, education, sanitation, and issues that are chronic in Latin America and that actually increase the situation for, for the poor? And for everyone in matter, but especially uh, in increase the situation for for people under the poverty line. Eduardo, I want to throw you this one. Oh, you're mute. You're on mute. Okay. Right. No, I was saying that yeah. you're giving me all the easy ones. Um, the first, I mean, they say. <laughs> there is a political rationale, right? I mean, political is always more uh, uh, profitable to give money directly, even if it's through an automatic cash transfer and to build infrastructure simply because infrastructure is a public good and it's actually publicly used. So, so you know, the debate is, it will be politically motivated and the, what the Laura was saying, you know, what will happen with these emergency incomes actually go away, that will be the trigger. And, um, but then there is, uh, I mean, we will, even if we move forward with this, uh, either the guaranteed income or the UBI or any of these varieties, uh, but still we will be investing in, in public goods, right? I mean, the idea is to do both. The idea is to uh, 
have a balance. And uh, some of this um, income goes to essentially eliminate poverty, you know, extreme poverty. And that uh, there is no infrastructure, no public service that can actually compensate a population that is deprived from the minimum basic needs. There is no education that works on that. So in terms of poverty and extreme poverty, particularly extreme poverty, you know, the thing that uh, Martin Luther King had in mind when he was uh, saying you know, we have to make everybody a consumer, uh, there is no replacement. There is no, there is no trade-off between it. Simply because you, know, you cannot build the habitat if the guy has to have any food on the table. So that's one motivation. So you have to have a mix for sure. Now, the question is why would you go universal? That's a completely different question. That, that's the trade-off between targeted and universal that uh, uh, Nora was mentioning before. Uh, I'm not sure, as I said before, that we need to go universal. I would probably rather try first the guaranteed income, starting from what we are now during the pandemic and then move forward if that helps. Because, you know, money you know, implies there is a an opportunity cost, and the opportunity cost are schools and hospitals. But, but the minimum guaranteed income for the poor, I think, uh, has an impact that cannot be replaced by by infrastructure. Actually, it's complementary. If you build schools in a poor neighborhood, you have to feed the people so that they don't go to school uh, uh, to eat or either, uh, so that they go to school in, in, a, in, a, in a condition that can actually profit from the, the education in a way that now is not happening. If you look at the results, you will see the strong correlation between education uh, efficiency, efficacy, and, and, and household income. So, uh, so that would be the, the first question. Now, moving forward with the universal version, you see, there is a story there I want to bring to the table because to all these varieties of uh, historical reasons for universal income, there is one that is strictly capitalist that has to do with uh, technology and technological em and employment. And that's probably what's has in, the people from uh, Palo Alto, from uh, um, uh, Singularity University has in mind when they go and promote this uh, universal income. The idea that if you have a declining labor share, which is something that's happened in most countries, exceptionally, particularly in the US, so you have a, an increasingly larger portion of the income in the hands of very rich people that consume very little, because you know typically you have saturation, so you save more if you're richer. And that might uh, create a savings cloud and a depression that will be extremely harmful for for the capitalist system in general. Now, of course, this is a view from people that actually fear from their markets. They need the markets, they need their consumers. They have to be everybody a consumer, not for ethical reasons, like in the case of Martin Luther King, but for you know market reasons. But even in that case, um, if technology starts replacing uh, labor and you want people, even on a, from an ethical point of view, you want these people to keep being you know, consumers and active, uh, uh, consumers in the society, you may need to redistribute that increasing share that goes to very small hands through a tax and transfer system. And UBI is one of these transfers. And sometimes during this debate, some people are thinking of this, of UBI schemes in exactly that matter. It's a tax of transfer to sort of compensate the growing inequality and declining uh, labor share. And you said the idea is to do both, but we have a reality where we haven't accomplished much in the last, at least since I've been, since I was born, I guess, in Brazil <laughs> several years ago. But uh, the, the, the issue in the uh, Samar Maziad from Moody, she actually sent a comment here that the importance to recognize the fiscal cost of UBI for Latin countries, particularly Brazil, with, uh, with its limited fiscal space, and uh, to recognize that there are trade offs and the government has to either raise additional resources, cut other spending, and that also comes as uh, with both a, a fiscal and a, a political cost. And Marcela, uh, this trade-off, how do you see UBI? I mean, as as a, 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 as a, a, a credible choice when the governments are having to, to weigh um, um, this trade-off. Uh, I'm sorry. Am I? Do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, so let me also chip into the discussion that Eduardo was uh, putting forward uh, just now. Um, so because I think all of these has to do with 
what are the advantages and, and, and disadvantages or costs of, of all these uh, different schemes. So um, as I was saying before, if, if you were to think of a truly UBI, that is to say again, a check reaches everybody that's even the very rich uh, in the country. That is a huge transformation that requires, as Eduardo was pointing out, uh, not only a huge political debate on e even the moral uh, angles of sending uh, checks to the to the rich, but also a way uh, uh, to fund those programs. And uh, it, what what many people uh, see as uh, what would uh, feasible and desirable is a system where uh, you have UBI, but then on the other hand, that's accompanied with a very extreme uh, reform of your tax system whereby uh, those richer people uh, are heavily taxed and those taxes fund these uh, programs. So th that is to say, of course, to the extent that you are sending cash to people that would replace some programs, in particular the programs that put cash into the hands of, of specific people. And so that would be a source of, of income. But then on the other hand, these, this is a completely change of the chip of people. Uh, you're completely redesigning what the social system looks like. Why doing something like that? Eduardo was rightly pointing at how crazy it looks to send uh, uh, cash to rich people. Uh, and, and that is true. And, 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 but there are still some arguments that people put forward. Um, one has to do with state capacity. And so one is the question of how hard it is to target specific groups, to find who in every single moment of time is having a hard time, or uh, to condition things uh, makes them harder. And so, uh, interestingly, countries with low capacities, low state capacity, and that is the case in Latin America as compared to the developed world, uh, may have an advantage to gain from these systems. Uh, not only because it's simpler to send everybody uh, the money, but also because to do that, you would have to build basically the database. Uh, Latin American countries typically only have uh, people declaring taxes when they're, they are supposed to be rich, and in particular when they are in, in, in a job and, and are earning a high, high salary. And then they have to build a separate databases for people in need, uh, which are the ones that they have had to rely on in the current crisis, but that have proven to be imperfect. And it's being very hard to reach people. If you didn't have to locate specific people that have specific needs, then things will be simpler. And, and that's one argument. Another argument is that you could deal uh, via this with other distortions that you have in their economy. So for instance, many countries in Latin America have the problem of having a minimum wage that uh, is very high and it's high not, not in terms of how much money uh, they are. They're very high compared to what uh, employers and employees would agree upon if, they, if, there, if there was no uh, regulation on how much is the minimum wage. And so what that means is that there is an incentive to, to have this informality on the other side. If uh, minimum wages are there because we think that people need to live on a minimum, and then you have this UBI, then you don't need the minimum wages any longer. And so you, you can remove that distortion. And so th that's the type of advantages that you would be gaining uh, against this crazy thing of sending money to reach people. But for that to be one, feasible, and two, acceptable, uh, then you would need to tax very heavily uh, that people. And, and if, if the question is not about the UBI per se, but about these more um, targeted programs uh, that, that for instance are targeted to the more vulnerable, uh, then the trade-off is, is a different one. Then you are probably replacing programs that you have now for these other programs that simply reach to say everybody that's vulnerable. That's a little bit harder than UBI because you need to identify who that people uh, are, who those people are, but but it, it has a rationale to it as well. Then why? What's the trade-off between the current programs and the thing that you have now? Obviously, if you have this uh, uh, this uh, guaranteed income then uh, one advantage of it is that you, you don't have a, a thousand little programs, as Laura was saying, with different conditionalities and things that are harder to manage, you have a single program. The thing is, the programs that we have right now are conditional. Conditional on behaviors that you are trying to incentivize. And so, for instance, many of the programs directed at families 
are conditional on them sending their, their children to school. And uh, the programs that we have for the young are conditional on them receiving uh, specific training. And so the, the trade-off is different. Again, the fiscal thing arises, but you're replacing one with the other. But the question is, do you rather want something that's conditional on a behavior, or you simply want something that's conditional on people being poor that uh, that may generate some, uh, or at least not generate the incentives that you wanted to generate with this conditional programs? I think that those are the trade-offs, and they depend on where do you want to sit. Uh, we're unfortunately getting close to the end of our time here, but I want to try to fit fit in a few more questions that we got um, um, here from 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 the WebEx and and our audience outside. So uh, we have a question before Martin Brancati from G20 Entrepreneurs uh, Argentina about the the whether it's changing a little bit the the direction here, but if it is a solution for for attack jobs for the fact that uh, uh, technological unemployment, so to speak. So uh, uh, that is that is one question and I wanna bundle it in with the, the, the question also of the lack of credibility and the polarization that we're seeing uh, across uh, right now, whether that kind of like also hinders the ability to, to, to actually push anything forward. Um, Laura, Eduardo, Laura, do you wanna take a crack of it and then, uh, and then Eduardo? Sure. Um, I would also like to to jump in on on the on the previous topic on the trade offs and so on. But from a macroeconomic um, uh, multiplier perspective, uh, we we ask we actually uh, started digging into the the literature on multiplier effects of cash transfers and social social benefits lately, and it's 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 incredible how little attention has been paid to um, the, the, the effects of these benefits on, on, on GDP. Uh, a lot of people talk about infrastructure investment as the major uh, part of spending that has uh, multiplier effects. So there, there is a, a large literature on that. And especially after the 2008 crisis, you saw a lot of studies emerging showing how these multipliers could be larger in a time of crisis and so on. And, and But in fact, there is very strong evidence that uh, cash transfers uh, are, have almost as large multipliers. And in fact, they also increase a lot during, uh, during crisis. And in this sense, the, the, the one point that I, I agree with, the, with what Marcel and Eduardo have said, but I, I would add uh, something which is, um, Part of the, the 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 minimum income or whatever type of cash transfer or minimum guaranteed income uh, that you that you transfer will come back in in terms of taxes even without uh, even if you don't consider the the, the taxation key scheme itself to fund it right part of it is spent in the economy and comes back in in terms of tax receipts uh, to the government it's not a negligible uh, part of it. Then on the question um, uh, on technological un uh, unemployment, um, yes, I think um, I, I saw something on Brazil lately that basically uh, finds that 50, almost 50% 50 of current occupations can be uh, automatized and, and replaced by, by, by robots, given how uh, these technological advances have been so far. So uh, it is true that in, in the underdeveloped uh, countries in the, in, the, in the global south in general, uh, you may face a, a larger uh, loss of jobs uh, from automation, um, given how low tech and how services sectors have a big share, um, uh, very low tax uh, sectors and activities and occupations have a big share in the economy. So the, the, the jobs that are created by this technological transformation tend to be uh, in the countries where the jobs tend to be in different countries than, than where the jobs are lost, right? Uh, there is a mismatch in terms of where these new technologies arise and create new jobs and where the technologies just destroy jobs. Um, and and COVID nineteen can can accelerate uh, these these trends uh, in terms of automation and so on. So I think that gives us uh, 
an additional reason to, to move forward with some type of, of minimum income guarantee. As I said, from the start, I do think that this has to move very gradually. I'm not in favor of just creating a, a universal system out of the blue, but moving gradually, targeting different groups and broader groups up to the point where you, you, can, you can create such a system um, also from the taxation side. Politically, of course, Brazil is in probably the most terrible shape at the, of these issues, and and uh, and I think um, it's it's of course very hard, and it's always been in some ways. Uh, the rich in Brazil are not uh, very fond of paying taxes, and I don't think uh, it's it's true for everywhere, of course. But in Brazil, I think it's uh, it's in part, it's particularly so. But I, I guess we 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 have an opportunity here to 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 at least expand our Bolsa Familia program and and have uh, a, a broader share of the population uh, receiving um, a minimum cash transfer at this point. Yeah. Eduardo, I would love to hear you on that. Okay. <laughs> Very briefly, one thing I would like to add to what Laura was saying, uh, the idea that of this multiplier is exactly what they have in mind in, in Palo Alto, this is the capitalist view, essentially. You know, you have to keep the, the wheel you know, rolling, and actually these plans uh, fuel demand that is actually helpful for the economy, the more so in an economic depression like the one we are you know, uh, in right now. Now, technological employment, there is... Uh, the story there, in my view, is the following. The idea originally was that uh, people will be working fewer hours. They will, they will be uh, displaced uh, workers, uh, but essentially lower demand for human labor. And that, uh, and more likely, because that's not exactly where looking, we're seeing right now. What you would see is uh, humans competing more forcefully for jobs, and then you see depressing uh, Low, lower wages, essentially, and uh, labor share, which is something you haven't seen in many countries, particularly advanced countries. Uh, in that case, the idea would have been, you know, ideal work would have been to complement uh, fewer hours and fewer labor income with this supplemental income that would come from the UDI. But this world, uh, in this world, technology actually increases productivity. So the idea of UBI from this modern perspective was sharing, distributing this prosperity by taxing and transferring this new productivity. The problem with that is that this is not happening yet, and probably in the future, but we are not seeing increasing uh, increased growth and huge productivity gains right now due to technology. So that's where the argument you know, starts to be reanalyzed, re, uh, you know, revised a little bit. But, uh, but again, the idea that uh, the uh, technology, that the Labor income destroyed by technology could come back to keep these uh, workers from, you know, going into poverty. It would come back in terms of UBI. I think it's a nice story. And search for a productivity boom actually can fuel that in terms of the numbers. But other, otherwise, the numbers are, simply don't square up. Uh, but just to conclude, you know, because we have been covering different versions of uh, something I think you know, makes sense, but you have to sequence very carefully. I, if you ask me, I believe that right now there are good reasons to consolidate a social safety nets in Latin America in particular, but in many other countries, that the crisis have shown to have a number of holes because of informality, self-employed uh, self people, independent work, to consolidate this uh, net full of holes into something that's a little more you know, compact, you know, like a, a simple guaranteed income plan that can at least the next time around, or during the next crisis, an economic depression can find our society a little bit more. I would, I would summarize my view right now as this, you know, guaranteed income as a first step, and then possibly, if you have the money, if you have the prosperity to share, maybe we can go back to the classic Greek days where people didn't work, you know, instead of having slaves, we'll have the machines, the technology. The problem is we haven't, get, we haven't gotten yet uh, that point. So guaranteed income, I think, is the natural first step. Yeah. Well, the jury is still out, I guess. I mean, I, I think we can take from here that a simple guarantee, income guarantee is a, 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 
a, a necessity and whether to, you know, how to pay for it is still out there and a conundrum for many governments to, to solve. I'm curious about the results of Marika, which is this small town I mentioned, uh, which of course they don't have the fiscal problem because they're right in front of oil fields and have royalties. But the research is going to tell us the actual impact, right, on even mental health or jobs and, and these kind of questions, even the moral theme overall of, of, of jobs. So uh, I'll be curious to see when they're able to restart, right, because they also had to stop for COVID. But anyway, uh, we will. Uh, we have a lot of other questions, but unfortunately, we ran out of time. Uh, I, I will tell everybody whose questions weren't answered. I'm definitely going to look at them carefully, and maybe it's another article that we need to write, or maybe one of our panelists wants to go more in depth in any of those. So we we will won't let this uh, this uh, subject um, uh, let go. This is definitely important right now and something that it's important for Latin America. I want to thank you, our panelists. Thank you, Laura, Eduardo, Marcelo. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your time with us today. And I want to thank you all for, for watching us. And of course, I want to uh, also thank our team at AQNASCOA who support the background here. Without them, we wouldn't have these events or all the events that we're doing happening. So thank you very much to the team and to everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and this do shall pass, right? We keep hearing that, so we're going to hope for that. So thank you so much for being here today and follow us.